Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here at the Spark Summit, and uh, I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Before I start, I uh, just want to do a quick audience poll. Um, how many of you are currently in or have been in the trenches doing data munging, wrangling, cleansing, and all of those good stuff? Okay, so hopefully this talk is for you. Um, I can assure you when this journey began, I had a full set of hair. Uh, but then again, you know, correlation is not causation, so. <laughs> All right. Uh, who am I? I'm uh, the Senior Director of uh, Big Data Platforms and Framework at Synchronos. Uh, we were recently acquired, I mean, I was with Razorsight, recently acquired by Synchronos late last year. Uh, been in this space for a long time. And then my goal is to solve real business problems with uh, the latest technology. Um, that's what everybody wants to do, but let me say that anyway. So how many of you have heard of Synchronos? Okay, Synchronos is a publicly traded company. We're headquartered right 45 minutes away in Jersey. And uh, we offer uh, personal cloud and activation platforms for large enterprises and communications providers around the globe. So what does that mean? So if you use a mobile device, any mobile device, chances are Synchronos is actually working behind the scenes for you. So whether it's activating your device on the network, whether it is migrating content, synchronizing contacts, whether it is setting up a personal cloud environment for you to move content back and forth, your pictures, your videos, Synchronos' platform and software is enabling all of that. So our solutions help operators connect to their customers. So whether you're onboarding a customer in the form of a device, uh, whether you're allowing them to synchronize data back and forth from the device to the cloud to other devices, or in, um, if you're driving a connected car, uh, the latest cars have 4Gs in them, Synchronos activates the connected cars. If you have a connected home, Synchronos probably activates a connected home. So that is the ecosystem we are in. And Razorsight used to offer predictive analytic solutions to the communications vertical. So the marriage is all about applying our platform and products and models to the solutions that Synchronos offers. So we are part of the Synchronos Analytics Group. Um, just to give a sample of what is big data at Synchronos, what do we do? This is just a sample for one operator, a large operator who's deployed the personal cloud solution. We're talking about um, you know, 30 million active subscribers on the app, about 8 million daily active subscribers or users. They're uploading anywhere from tens to hundreds of millions of pictures every day. So the data size is staggering. We have deployed the solution across five data centers, running on multiple clusters and all the good stuff. So this is truly big data, all those events coming from those devices that can be used to improve the customer experience whether it is um, looking at a better application functionality, whether it's looking at crash analysis, predicting failures, rolling out of applications and uh, release versions, all of those good stuff can, the, the data can be used for. So what does my team do? We are responsible for the uh, big data platforms and frameworks that is used to generate those consistent analytics. Um, the platform is deployed both on a private cloud and in uh, public cloud AWS infrastructure. And when we talk about analytics here, we talk about the full range. So it starts with the traditional descriptive analytics or BI world and the advanced predictive analytics. So both end of the spectrum are there. We have internal users, we have customer users who consume this, uh, this insights generated from the data. Um, you should be very familiar with this. In order to make any meaningful use of the data, it has to be processed. So right from ingestion all the way to profiling, parsing, transforming, enriching, aggregation, 
etc., down to the downstream processes, which might visualize it, which might apply models on top of it. This is what we're talking about data pipeline process. I'm going to walk you through what we've gone through. I mean, what does this mean? It's not simple. People waffle over it. But this is where we spend most of our lives. Uh, data is uh, not necessarily clean. The data is not necessarily structured, semi-structured. The definitions are missing. Legacy systems. There's all sorts of things happening in here. So, our journey started with uh, a version one back in the day, and you folks should be very familiar with this. This is the day of the uh, multiple ETL jobs running uh, outside the context of data. Um, storage and processing were separated. Things were running in long running batches. Um, whenever we encountered any large volumes of data set, the latency increased. There's no support for unstructured data. Historically speaking, these sort of solutions took a year to put in place, and it's pretty expensive, inflexible, large teams working across. We could not store large amounts of data online because of obvious restrictions. So this was the, the life back then. Then we entered into an appliance world where, okay, we'll put the uh, storage and processing together in one verticalized appliance. It was great, performance improved, latency reduced, but cost increased. Still, we had to do it in batches, although low latency batches. Still, we couldn't support um, unstructured data. Still, the costs were so prohibitive that we couldn't store the data there. We had to do it just, just in time processing, maybe store a limited amount of data and move it out somewhere else. Didn't work out. So move on to the next version. Then the whole Hadoop thing came about and said, let's go there. Um, we looked at that. And he said that, you know, uh, there's a big skills gap here to uh, have a, a bunch of people who are familiar with certain technologies and to migrate into that. We said, let's take a pause and see where this is headed before jumping in. And we saw MapReduce, uh, Pig, Hive, and a whole bunch of other acronyms. Um, so we said, let's take a, a pause on that. It, we didn't want to do a technology migration for the heck of it. Uh, what we realized was the, um, the benefits would not be there immediately. So uh, a couple of years ago, mercifully, out came Spark. So Spark uh, provided a promise. It had everything required for pipelining. It had streaming. It had batch. It had SQL access. It had um, rich features, uh, in-memory storage. So performance was better. So we said, let's take a look at that and let's centralize our pipeline process on this platform. So this is what we call our V4 um, data pipeline. ETLs are closer to data. We can process stream or batches, superior performance compared to MapReduce and other uh, options. What we did this time is we didn't want to open it up for every single developer or app developer out there. We abstracted it and built a framework. So we said all the components needed for data pipeline processing, let's build components and then expose those components to those app developers for them to hook it up in a data pipeline process. So it simplified the design. It significantly reduced the time for us to roll out a solution. And it, uh, it was highly flexible for us too. So um, with that, I'm going to go into data profiling. This is interesting. Good old days, we had uh, volumes of data. And when you want to do profiling, especially for the uh, modelers, um, they would say that uh, take a sample, and then we'll, we'll profile the data in a sample, and then utilize it to build the model. But then in the big data world came all the, the conventional wisdom is, no, use the full population. Uh, don't use the sample. Run your model, train your model on the full population. Okay. Uh, then there are others that say, put everything in the lake, and then somehow everything will work out. Uh, how does that work? Uh, we still have to go through what the data is uh, to still need to understand the, the construct. So why, why do we still, we still need data profiling. We need to understand what is in those data sets. We need to understand metrics. We need to understand the risks associated with creating rules. I mean, when you want to create an analytic data set, Oftentimes, you have to stitch the data to create that analytic record, which then could be used by the modeler. So when you stitch it, how do you generate the right rules? How do you make sure the quality of the data is good? Can we identify the metadata from the data set so that we can create 
uh, those configurations that can be used in the pipeline process instead of manually hooking it up together. How do we understand the challenges of data and inconsistencies ahead of time? So anything you find later in a cycle is always more expensive and tough to, uh, to fix. Also another uh, uh, category of solutions came where we want to do ad hoc search, ad hoc full text search. So in order to do those, you need to tag the data. How can you do tagging of data, categorize the data without profiling? So profiling became a key aspect of that as well. So um, when we looked at this challenge, and this is where most of the time was spent, if you broke down the project life cycle, munging, wrangling, whatever term you want to use, that's where most of the time was spent. And um, if you really broke it down, there was a lot of touch points. So from the time the ingestion uh, location data was moved to some other location and there were money policies, security concerns. So moving data here and there was not possible. And um, as a result of all of that, there was, you know, just the interest level in any project is how soon it can be delivered. If it takes two months, and, uh, multiple months, then the, the, the opportunity is typically lost. So we wanted to address this particular challenge. So um, the typical scenario, I'm not saying everybody has this, but I have seen uh, this many a time. We have analysts, business analysts, want to get a bunch of data into an Excel or somewhere else and look at it. Uh, big data, you cannot do that. Okay, so we'll put that in a database and run our profiler, but then you cannot put it in a database unless you know what the data is, what the schema is, what the structure is. Um, we get data from customers and they say, this is what it is, but it is nowhere close to what it is. So that went cycle time there to figure out what, what exactly did you send us type of thing. Um, you, you couldn't move data back and forth. That's the, the fundamental problem. You could not move it from a, a data lake location into a database or back to some other store. So all of those dependencies were uh, causing a huge uh, headache. So what did we need? We need speed. We need agility, we need automation. How do we automate this thing? How do we put the power back with the business analyst or data analyst? So we set out with, this is the minimum data profiler requirements. We said all data is going to reside in the data lake. So you should be able to profile the data in the data lake. You should be able to review and validate the data. You should be able to review the statistics of the data. You should be able to use that same results to create metadata to, f to run your um, um, data pipeline processing. You should also potentially be able to create downstream, uh, downstream schema. So if you're going to load this data into an index or into a downstream database, you should be able to create the schemas automatically. These were the um, goals that we set out to achieve. So Spark, uh, came to the rescue. We have large data sets, multiple data objects. We can move that into an RDD, split it up uh, by field, and run all sorts of metrics. We can use um, built-in transformations by Spark. That was very nice. Performance was great. So how does this work? So the simple flow is we have a, a very usable uh, web application. The user, all the user does is points to a data lake location and say pick up a set of files based on masks, uh, the full set of data objects, and then launch the Spark application, which then runs in the background, profiles the entire data set, and publishes the result to a repository, which is viewable in the web application. Pretty simple. What it generates is a bunch of univariate statistics, whether you are a numerical field or a non-numeric field, there's a whole bunch of things that is needed by the data scientist to say how many nulls, do we, can we create imputation rules out there, what's the health of those various attributes or the histogram, kurtosis, mean, median, all those good stuff comes out, uh, which can be used. This can be for an individual data set. It can be for any data in the data lake. It could be merged data, stitched data, enriched data. At the end of the day, these things are important before you can start the modeling process. So this is a sample screenshot, what it looks like. This is a simple Angular web app. You can go in there and pull up a result of a particular data set profile, give you, uh, you know, a color-coded health of a data field, green, orange, red, however you want to set the threshold. Uh, it'll 
present all those statistics about the data field, whether it is um, you know amount of null, histograms, your box charts, things like that. So, uh, in language that is very usable for the data analyst or business analyst or data scientist. It also generates, uh, as I mentioned, uh, full-fledged JSON um, metadata. So when you process the profiler, the profiler looks at all the fields. It does not only, it understands, it generates the data type, it generates the, the content statistics, it also generates the, uh, the JSON uh, metadata, which then is used by the data pipeline workflow. So if you want to operate on that, uh, data set to transform it, enrich it, you could use this metadata to drive that. It also generates schemas, uh, downstream DDLs automatically from the profile output. So, user does not have to go in and create all of that. Some data sets are very large and there are 40, 50 of them. You can see how much time can be saved by just profiling it, creating the data set, I mean the DDL. The advantages are you can all the source data already is in the data lake. It's been dumped into the data lake per the, uh, the data location. All the profiling can be done in the data lake. There's no need to move the data back and forth. You can profile the entire data set. You don't have to work with the sample. You can integrate the, the results into a metadata configuration or a downstream DDL. All of this saves a tremendous amount of time. It might sound trivial, but for those of us who go through this for a living, it's a lot of time. So, objective is to send cleaner data down to the modelers because at the end of the day, if you want to generate rules, uh, if you want to generate enrichment, the data pipeline process can be built accurately to cater to the needs of the, the data scientists downstream. So, we have seen significant improvement as a result of this sort of approach. Uh, what used to take weeks, sometimes days, now is cut down to hours. The overall data pipeline process has been reduced 80 percent, I would say, which is why we say from the time we receive the data, we can put out full-fledged metrics in the form of, you know, let's say dashboards and um, descriptive insights in under a month. Um, we have identified data quality issues sometimes that trip us up ahead of time, empowered the business analytics as well. Uh, Anyway, so I want to quickly go through this. This is just one component of our pipeline process. Profiling is the first part. But when we built the stack from the ground up with Spark, we said, you know what? We need a multi-layer architecture, each layer logically performing a particular function, right from ingestion to data storage to data processing to modeling to integration to consumption. It's a, it's a pretty layered infrastructure there. And this is the architecture we have in place today. We, we just talked about the uh, data management layer. So the framework components, they are all Spark components, um, at least in the profiling, parsing, transformation, integration layer. Each component has a set of functions. These components can be hooked up in a simple Uzi workflow, completely configurable through metadata. Uh, so the building blocks are available for the app developers. They don't have to sit in and write all those transformations. In fact, in the profiling and parsing, we have our own scripting engine. Um, integrated into that, so it's very easy to transform data. Right, some cleansing rules, lookups, substitutions, imputations, all of that are very easy to do uh, with this sort of a framework approach. If you look at the architecture, uh, we have the data lake, uh, we have the orchestration layer, which is, um, which is a Uzi, and then we have all the, the, the green boxes there are components in the pipeline, whether it's a SQL engine or a data prep engine or a database loader using scoop or a partitioner, the whole thing is uh, built in in a component uh, fashion. And then if you look at the stack itself, we have a certain, a certain software um, uh, in there. We've used Elasticsearch for index uh, storage for quick retrieval ad hoc analysis. We have the data lake, just a map part distribution. We use Spark extensively in the data processing arena. We have our own um, AngularJS uh, visualization layer. What's next? We expand it. We continue to expand our component set and move more into the value aspect of it, bivariate analysis, multicollinearity, all of those things that uh, typically is done on the data. We want to componentize that and string it together in the, uh, in the data pipeline uh, as, a, as after the univariate. So the variable creation or the analytic set creation 
I'm going to zip it through here. So, the lessons learned here is uh, let the business drive technology adoption. There are a lot of hidden costs, um, plan incremental updates, deliver something to the business periodically, simplify the whole thing. Um, framework based development is very, very helpful to speed up delivery and also uh, reduce our overall cost. I mean, at the end of the day, what our customers need is what is on the right. I know when a customer calls into a contact center, they want to know what is the lifetime value, what is the churn risk, what is the profitability. That's the kind of information they want. All the stuff on the left, that's the big data stuff, right? So we are all, all about delivering what's on the right to the customer to, to use the data insights to better their business. With that, I will end my talk. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>